Francesca, welcome and thank you for your time and uh, for the presentation tonight. Um, as I said, I'm really excited that uh, we are having this session with the Bennington College representative tonight. It's the first time for us uh, in Macedonia and for our students at the Competitive College Club um, uh, to hear more about Bennington and liberal arts in general. Uh, since as I mentioned earlier, uh, I see Bennington College on a student's list almost every year. So I'm really gla glad that we have you here tonight and I hope we'll have interesting questions. Welcome, uh, Francesca, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill Hanna, and thank you all so much for for joining. Um, I uh, was uh, I'm originally from Northern England, and I went through the college application process to the US myself through um, a program funded by Education USA and, and Fulbright. So um, you're all close to my heart, and thank you so much again for for allowing me to come in and speak to you all about um, progressive liberal arts colleges in the US. Um, so I will be using Bennington as an example throughout this presentation, but but really I just hope to to give you all a sense of really the breadth of, of different academic styles uh, that are available to you at different liberal arts colleges uh, in the US. Uh, and so just to begin with, uh, I know for a, a lot of students, particularly uh, you know those of you from Western Europe, um, the liberal arts uh, style is very different than what we're used to. Uh, in our home countries. Uh, and so I'll just walk through briefly uh, what a traditional liberal arts education looks like. Uh, and then I will go into talk uh, a little bit about uh, what we know as progressive liberal arts. So uh, kind of taking that traditional education uh, and giving it a little bit more flexibility for students. Uh, so just as a kind of introduction, uh, again, I'm Fran, I'm from Bennington College and the, the picture that you see on your screen right now is actually a shot of our campus. So um, I'm actually sitting talking to you today from this little village over here. Uh, and this itself is a snap of uh, the actual college campus uh, that we have. So just to start off with, uh, in terms of talking about what the liberal arts are. Um, so in terms of thinking about, you know, more broadly, uh, what the liberal arts are, uh, it was initially kind of designed uh, as a way to offer students an alternative to more technical educations. Uh, so educations that really trained you uh, for one specific career uh, or particular job uh, or taught you about one particular thing. Uh, so the idea of the liberal arts is uh, an education that educates you as an entire person. So it doesn't just teach you about one particular area. So let's say math uh, or biology uh, or chemistry, um, but instead it teaches you uh, about multiple different areas of study or disciplines. Uh, and so oftentimes when you talk to representatives like myself about the liberal arts, you'll hear the term breadth and depth uh, or also the T-shaped student. So uh, essentially what is common uh, across all different styles of liberal arts models is that every student spends their first year of college just exploring different areas of study. Uh, so oftentimes if we're applying to more traditional universities uh, within Western Europe, uh, you will decide that you want to study one individual subject and you will go on to university uh, and you will study that for most often three years, sometimes four, uh, and you'll have set courses that you take uh, and that education will prepare you for a specific career path. The liberal arts says that, you know, the world doesn't uh, oftentimes make sense in terms of one or two subjects, but oftentimes we really ought to be able to study a particular topic or an area uh, through multiple different disciplines. So that's where the breadth and depth comes in. We want to educate students across a variety of the arts, humanities and sciences uh, so that they can have uh, really a three-dimensional understanding uh, of the way that the world works around them. So that first year is really spent exploring all of your different interests from dance to uh, you know, chemistry to sociology really allowing you to get a better sense of what it is that you're passionate about. After that first year within a liberal arts college education, 
uh, that's where this depth moment comes in. So after you've had a year of exploration, the majority of colleges will ask you to decide uh, what subject area or what discipline you'd like to continue studying. So you've had that moment of breadth studying across disciplines, and now you spend the rest of your time uh, going deep into one or two different areas. So that's why we call it the T-shaped student. And you'll see a lot of this by college reps in the US. Uh, another kind of key tenant of the liberal arts is that it gives students an ability to work on big, complex ideas. Uh, so not just uh, kind of approaching a problem or an issue uh, by one lens. So if you're a math student studying the economy by creating formulas, if you're a biology student studying climate change by conducting uh, scientific experiments, uh, but instead to be able to think about this through a variety of different ways. Uh, so taking climate change, for example, being able to look at it through environmental science, through social justice, uh, through sociology, being able to really understand uh, in a holistic way uh, the issues that we face today. Uh, another kind of key area is that it's not about taking four years to uh, teach students what to think. So educating you in terms of content uh, or telling you uh, what you should think about the subjects that you're taking. Uh, instead, the whole idea of the liberal arts is that we teach you how to think. Uh, so oftentimes these are called soft skills. Uh, the liberal arts is really about teaching students how to think critically, uh, how to reflect, uh, and also how to communicate. Uh, these are skills that you can take with you no matter where you end up in your future. Uh, and finally, in that same kind of idea about thinking critically, not in terms of what to think, but how to think, uh, we want you to be able to think on your feet and be flexible. Uh, the world is constantly changing. And so a liberal arts education is designed to teach you how to thrive in an ever-changing world. Uh, I think a perfect example of that is that within the US here, uh, your average college graduate will experience between five and seven different careers in their lifetime. So a technical education is really centered on kind of giving you the skills that you need to thrive in one particular area. The liberal arts says it doesn't matter what those five to seven career paths are, we will give you the skills and capacities necessary to thrive in any of them. Again, through those soft kind of skills. So moving on to kind of the actual uh, nitty gritty of, of a liberal arts education, uh, the liberal arts encompasses academic programs across the arts, the sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. Uh, the biggest sell for a lot of students, the reason that a lot of international students turn uh, to uh, a liberal arts education in the US versus oftentimes a more technical education at home, is that you have the flexibility to enter undecided. So that essentially means when you're filling out your college applications, you can say, I actually don't know what I want to do yet. And that is OK. So you can apply to a college to be admitted to the entire uh, institution as a whole. You don't apply to a specific program. So you don't have to make that decision, you know, at 17 years old, what you want to do for the rest of your life. Instead, you can say, you know, this is who I am. This is what I'm interested in, but this is why I'm going to college to figure this out. Oftentimes, for the majority of liberal arts institutions, uh, there's a, a common structure that they have. Uh, and so oftentimes that structure is made up of what we call majors. Uh, so different subject areas that students can choose to study, uh, as well as minors, which is, again, subject areas, but that you'll take less courses in. Uh, as well as electives. So the one-off course that you might take outside of the subject that you're studying at college. Uh, we also see most often what we call a core or a common curriculum. So you will probably all be familiar with this in your previous experiences in education. There are those courses that you just have to take. Uh, oftentimes some of the most common required courses at a liberal arts college is uh, writing courses, uh, as well as different requirements across subjects. So for example, if you attend uh, a traditional liberal arts college, 
Uh, one of the most likely requirements will be that you have to take a course in the humanities, you have to take a course in a foreign language, in the sciences, in writing. The idea being, again, that students have an experience uh, and learn about a wide variety of different subject areas. What is a major? Um, so essentially, when we are talking about majors, again, in that traditional uh, kind of liberal arts program, uh, a major is essentially a preset pathway. So after you've spent this year exploring at the majority of liberal arts colleges in the US, uh, you will then in your second year decide what it is that you'd like to study. So a major can be most often uh, is a particular discipline. So a major could be math, it could be computer science, it could be dance, physics. Uh, but essentially, after you've had that year, you decide what major you would like to continue to study throughout your final three years. So again, the idea of you decide what you like to study, but it's the institution, the college, who oftentimes tells you how you're going to study that. So you say you're passionate about biology and you want to pursue it, then your college will turn around and say, okay, these are the required courses uh, for you to take in biology to graduate with that Bachelor of Science degree. So oftentimes that preset pathway is determined by faculty as well as staff at that college. Uh, it is kind of a uh, more linear approach to studying a discipline. So there'll be introductory courses, uh, there'll be intermediate courses, and there'll be advanced level courses. And so as you go throughout those final three years, you'll progress through that increase in level of difficulty within that chosen major. Again, there'll be some specific required courses, uh, and then there'll also be some electives. So for, let's say, two of your credits each term, you will be able to choose one of the five following options. But for the most part, the majority of the courses that you take uh, have kind of been decided before you declared that major. Uh, and again, typically within one discipline. So that's kind of the, the traditional liberal arts structure that you will see most often uh, throughout the US. There are almost 200 different liberal arts colleges uh, in the US, uh, and all of them have a different way of offering uh, a liberal arts education. The majority follow the more traditional route as you saw there, but there's also a significant amount of colleges who are offering a more progressive liberal arts education, which essentially means uh, they're offering a more student-directed education. So at Bennington, we certainly offer an alternative model for students. And there are a number of other liberal arts colleges across the US that also do that. So at Bennington, we offer what's known as a self-designed education. So if you kind of cast your mind back to when I was just talking about the process of declaring a major, where you decided what you want to study, and then you were given the guidance on how you were going to study it. At Bennington, students decide what they would like to study, but they also design their own pathway. So it's very student-driven and student-centered, and we don't have any preset pathways to offer students. They carve that out for themselves. So going on with that, we don't have any required courses uh, or core courses or a curriculum. So instead of asking students to all take one or two specific courses, uh, we say that will be different for every student. You know, the student who is studying uh, the uh, water contamination in the local village of Hoosick next door to Bennington will certainly get more from an environmental science course uh, than a student who is perhaps exploring uh, dance and public action. Uh, and so we want students to really make that decision for themselves. And so that is why our students decide how they'd like to spend their three years studying uh, uh, kind of what they're passionate about. So the idea with this is that it's a liberal arts education that's very intentional. Uh, so students are taking courses because they're the courses that they want to take and the courses that really matter to them. Uh, it's reflective. We really want you to consistently think about why am I studying what I'm studying? Uh, what impacts do I want to have on the world when I leave this place? Uh, and what impact do I want to have on the communities uh, that are directly influenced by what I'm studying? Uh, it's also interconnected. 
So again, the idea that in the more traditional uh, liberal arts structure, oftentimes you're pursuing a major that is just one discipline. Students at Bennington decide what they want to study uh, without the bounds of subjects in that way. Uh, so a lot of students will study a particular topic, climate change, uh, or they'll study a question, uh, how do human perceptions of the environment help shift policy? Uh, something that is a, uh, kind of intricate as that, uh, but that is very individualized to that student. So at Bennington, we call that the plan process. Essentially, the process by which students arrive at Bennington, spend a year exploring uh, across disciplines and creating their curriculum for themselves, uh, and then through uh, very intentional uh, mentorship by current faculty and staff, they create their own individualized course of study. So again, the plan process uh, is really uh, completely driven by you. Uh, as I talked about in kind of that more traditional liberal arts structure, you'll spend a year exploring. Uh, among more progressive liberal arts colleges, that doesn't change. We still want you to spend that first year exploring. And in your second year, this is where we tend to diverge in terms of the way that we structure our academics. So as opposed to saying, what major would you like to declare? We ask you to think about the three questions at the top. What are you passionate about? Uh, what drives you? Uh, and again, what impact will you have on the communities that matter to you? And so then we ask you to write an essay, right at the same point as uh, another college you might declare a major. We ask you to write a five to six page paper that answers the bottom three questions. What will you study? It can be a question, a topic, it can be also a discipline. If you say, I'm passionate about physics and music, and that's what I want to study, that is also completely fine. We ask you why you're studying it. So why is it that this keeps you up at night? Why are you passionate about this particular uh, area of study uh, or course of study? And then finally, how will you study it? So at Bennington, we offer 45 different areas of study and you can see them on the screen right now. So for students who are deciding what it is that they would like to study throughout their plan process, they will identify which of these areas of study they would like to lean on most in order to pursue and get answers to that kind of topic that they're passionate about. Uh, given that we have no core requirements and there is no pre-prescribed route for each student to take depending on what they study, any student at Bennington can take any uh, kind of certainly introductory level course, but can take courses in any of our 45 different areas of study. We just ask students to identify which they'll lean on most uh, as it relates to their individualized plan. So I just want to throw out some examples. Uh, so again, there's so many different styles of teaching liberal arts in the United States. On the one hand, you have the more traditional style that I walked through a little earlier. And on the other hand, this more progressive liberal arts style where students not only decide what they want to study, uh, but also how. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of uh, students' plans at Bennington. So why do we move that way? Uh, a student is studying this uh, by taking courses in dance as well as the humanity. So that's on studying human movement from artistic and geopolitical lenses dance and migration. We also have another uh, example of a student who's passionate about economics. Uh, so this student studies asset inequality in India using economics, philosophy and math. And finally, uh, this is actually a, a student I work with called Kaya, uh, inclusive theatre spaces. Uh, how can I, as a black theatre professional, make the spaces I inhabit more equitable, diverse and inclusive? Uh, so Kaya is studying this through theatre and black studies. So as you can see, it looks a little different to saying, I study theatre. Instead, it's saying, this is the part of theatre that I'm passionate about. And this is the impact that I want to have moving forward. And so Kaya has created her entire plan process in education around her specific passions. Oftentimes also within more progressive liberal arts models, uh, as well as more traditional liberal arts models as well, 
uh, there'll be some form of work integrated learning. So the chance for you to pursue internships and work experiences uh, in the real world while you're studying. So uh, giving Bennington as an example, uh, we call this fieldwork term. So every single year between January and February, every one of our students pursues six weeks of work experience uh, in a field related to what they are studying. So as students are developing their own pathway through Bennington, they can test their ideas in real fields of work. So I just mentioned Kaya, who's studying theatre and black studies. Uh, last year, Kaya pursued uh, a fellowship through the Lucille Lortel Theatre Foundation in New York City. Uh, so she uh, pursued lighting design uh, at an off-Broadway theatre in New York City uh, through a fully funded fellowship. That was a way that Kaya could say, this is my specific niche, this is what I'm studying. And here's how I can see what it would look like after I graduate to create a space where I can make this my career. So in terms of just kind of wrapping up and thinking about all of that info right there, uh, the most important thing to really think about with the liberal arts is kind of, again, that it stands uh, kind of separate from more technical ideas of education. So if you are someone who has multiple different interests, if you can't decide what that one subject is uh, that you would like to have as a career, or you do know what it is, but you would also like to pursue it through other lenses as well. So you're passionate about economics, but you also want to take political science and you want to take public action and you'd like to take a little bit of music. Uh, the liberal arts is probably a really great option for you. If you're a student who, again, kind of wants a little bit more flexibility away from that traditional uh, liberal arts model where there are preset pathways, uh, more progressive liberal arts colleges might be a good option for you too. Uh, so Bennington certainly isn't the only uh, progressive liberal arts college in the US. Uh, this is just one example of the different options that are available to you. Uh, there are plenty of other colleges across the US doing some really interesting things with the liberal arts. Um, there's Bard, there's Goucher, there's St. John's, uh, Colorado College. Uh, there's a number uh, of progressive US liberal arts colleges that might just be your perfect fit. Uh, so I'd encourage you to uh, kind of do your research, uh, explore just how different liberal arts colleges in the US can be. Uh, and I'm also happy to answer any questions after our Q&A today. So uh, if any questions do come up in the future about Bennington uh, or about progressive liberal arts models, please feel free to, to email me uh, at the email on the screen there. Uh, you can also uh, find more uh, about Bennington and especially the student experience uh, by following us on Instagram. We have current students who create some really great content and information for students there. So that's it, at Bennington. Uh, but thank you all so much for your time, and I will be happy uh, to kind of end this more formal side of the presentation and, and start answering your questions. Hello, can we just ask questions? Yeah, absolutely, Philippe. I, I can only see um, one other question in the chat, so please feel free to, to ask yours and then I will also answer the other question that's there. Yes, actually, I, I, my question, um, I, I have a couple of questions, but my first question is echoing uh, Leonid's question, uh, which is, what will the title on the degree be afterwards? Like, say that you focus in uh, the India, um, assets in India, uh, focus area. Like, does your degree then say philosophy, economics, and math? That's a great question. Absolutely wonderful. Um, so every student at Bennington, as is common at a lot of uh, kind of progressive liberal arts colleges, um, will graduate with a Bachelor of Arts in the liberal arts. Um, really, in order to do it justice, that uh, even if a student kind of uh, finds their studies neatly fitting into uh, one particular discipline, they'll have still taken multiple courses um, within other areas. Uh, the, the kind of exception to that is, is, as you said, Philippe, kind of thinking about the student who's studying economics and has 
you know, really dig deep into philosophy and math, uh, you can kind of petition the dean's office and say to them, this is kind of Bennington specific now as well. It, it will work different. A lot of other liberal arts colleges um, to have. Right. So you essentially petition to get a major is like what I'm hearing. Like uh, if you don't petition to get a major, you get like general liberal liberal arts degree and uh, you can if you so choose like focus and like petition to like get like a specific title on your on your degree or education yeah absolutely Philippe. and, and uh, having said that you know at a lot of more traditional liberal arts colleges where you would declare a major uh, there are some that will change your kind of degree type so for example if you major in uh, biology you would probably graduate, you could graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree as opposed to a Bachelor of Arts. Uh, oftentimes there are colleges that have kind of more non-traditional academic structures like Bennington, uh, that's when you will kind of, no matter what you study, oftentimes graduate with a Bachelor of Arts. Cool, cool. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, super quickly, I actually have to drop very soon and uh, I'm not even a student trying to apply. I graduated with uh, a liberal arts degree and I'm a huge fan. I'm like, like, proposed, like everyone that's in this conversation that's a student should definitely consider what Francesca is talking about. The, I think that's like uh, a little bit like, sorry for like a little hijacking, like uh, what students should really think about is like the difference between what, what facultet means in Macedonia and what college means in the United States, and especially liberal arts college. When you talk about facultet in Macedonia, you enroll into a program. You go to Finki, or you go to Ekonomski, or Praven, or whatever, and you get a specific degree, and you don't have the flexibility to even go take classes from the other schools. When you go to college in America, and especially a college like this one, what, uh, like, and that, that's what Francesco was talking about for the first 20 minutes, you have like all of this freedom, like especially in your first year, to take any class you want from any of the different faculty that you get at Ukim in Skopje. Uh, and you essentially have the opportunity to start like three or four different eff like effective faculty uh, and uh, get the um, essentially understanding to know what you want to do in the future. When I came to uh, the United States, I also came from Skopje. Uh, when I came to the United States, I wanted to study uh, government and economics. Um, like I also took a bunch of classes in sociology and mainly computer science in my freshman year uh, in college and ended up essentially majoring in computer science. My college did have specific majors, but out of the 35 classes that I took in college, only 10 were in my computer science major, which means that I got a very, very, very wide array of classes. And I can't uh, like say enough how important this is for someone who is 18 years old considering to go to university and their career. Uh, and go into, like, like six or seven different careers over your lifetime. Um, like uh, it's extremely important to essentially have the ability to explore and make those decisions for yourself of what you want to study. So that's all I want to say. Uh, and one thing that I would suggest that Francesca like goes a little bit deeper on is um, essentially the ability uh, for students to take uh, specific uh, classes in like majors that people here are potentially specifically interested in along the lines of like uh, the topic of like assets in India is like a little uh, foreign, as well as like theater and like um, racial diversity in theater. Um, like I suppose like people here probably want to study things like a little bit more like computer science or economics or psychology or something like that. Like uh, I, uh, and of course you touched upon those, um, but um, like I think that those probably are a little bit more uh, in touch with like what uh, Macedonian uh, juniors are thinking about. And sorry for hijacking again, I'm going to drop now. Uh, Sorry, like, uh, I hope that this was useful at all. Sorry for hijacking. Uh, nice to meet you, Francesca. Uh, all the best to all the students in the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and that absolutely was not hijacking at all. I'd love to echo everything you just said. Um, and certainly, yeah, I think, um, you know, for students who are passionate about, um, you know, as you mentioned, some common themes, computer science, psychology, uh, kind of courses that um, can be studied in, either a more traditional way, or again, certainly at Bennington, we do offer those as areas of study. Uh, oftentimes within kind of more progressive liberal arts, uh, you'll see courses that are based uh, more around specific topics. Uh, so for example, uh, the student who is studying uh, kind of uh, economic inequity in India um, could have taken uh, a course taught by a local one of our faculty members uh, 
around uh, kind of socioeconomic standing and inequality, understanding that relationship within different environments uh, versus a, a, a course that might be seen more as an introductory economics course uh, of Econ 101, for example. Um, so in the 45 areas of, of study that I, I mentioned, we have a significant amount of students who are passionate about just one or two of those. And so if you study psychology or computer science uh, or even physics within the liberal arts, you'll still be able to gain you know, that really crucial foundation within those subjects to be able to go on to pursue them as a career. Uh, but you'll also be able to take courses in other disciplines uh, that also will directly to re uh, relate to that subject. So for example, if you're taking psychology, uh, it might be uh, beneficial to also take a couple of courses in political science uh, or in sociology. Uh, there's a significant overlap there that uh, students can really take advantage of within the liberal arts that they might not have the chance to uh, kind of in a more traditional uh, linear approach to studying those subjects. So uh, I will absolutely, Bilhana has uh, also the, the presentation that I just showed you all. And so uh, if you'd like to kind of take a look at that list of areas of study that we offer, um, that's certainly on the website as well. And I'm, I'm more than happy to speak with any of you individually about your particular interests and how that would work at Benton as well. So I'm just seeing a question about the open curriculum. Uh, the advanced just the core curriculum. They're great questions, Mila. So um, in terms of the open curriculum, uh, open curriculum essentially means that there, again, there's no required courses. Students choose what courses they would like to take uh, from the get-go. So you don't have any requirements to take courses within, for example, uh, a foreign language, within math, within you know, STEM or the social sciences. Um, the potential advantages of a core curriculum uh, is that it builds a really solid foundation for students it really pushes students to challenge themselves and take courses, not only in subjects that they're comfortable with, uh, but also in subjects that they wouldn't automatically choose. Uh, so for example, if you kind of have taken, you know, four years of mathematics and now you're saying, I really want to distance myself, uh, taking a course in math in college uh, might look a lot different to what you're accustomed to. And it might help you you know, really build that set of skills that you can then apply when you go on to pursue your career in, in your chosen field. Uh, and certainly, uh, the question was, if there are any cases when a student uh, majors in science and minors in the arts, so as in a student will major in one uh, kind of discipline and minor in another? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I've seen uh, kind of in the more traditional liberal arts model, a significant amount of students will major in uh, one subject such as, you know, math, computer science, dance, physics, uh, and they will minor in a subject that is completely unrelated. Uh, it's a chance for students to study more than one thing. Uh, what I would say is that oftentimes students will major in uh, a area that they're seriously thinking about going into a career with uh, and they use their minor as a way to pursue an interest that also kind of helps them with that or that is unrelated that they're just passionate about as well and absolutely at a lot of uh, again more traditional liberal arts colleges that offer major and minors a significant amount of colleges will offer you the option to double major uh, so essentially take two majors in two different disciplines. There's also a significant amount of colleges who also have that major minor system uh, where you can create your own major by combining courses from multiple different areas. So if you're a student who is kind of sitting right now and thinking, you know, the completely open curriculum uh, and progressive model of liberal arts seems a little too uh, kind of self-directed for me, but also I'd like a little bit more freedom than this kind of pre-prescribed list of subjects, that might be a great option for you too. 
The student to faculty ratio at Bennington uh, is 10 to 1. So for every 10 students, we have one faculty member. Um, we're a very, very small liberal arts college uh, in uh, southwestern Vermont. Uh, and so we are in the northeast of the US. We have around 700 students. And so again, that really self-directed education, for that to really work, we really need to have small class sizes uh, that are discussion-based where you can think through uh, your ideas and what you're passionate about, uh, you know, with a few of your peers as well as your faculty. And that's another great question. So when you apply to a liberal arts college, each college will have a different way of asking about what you're interested in studying on the application. Uh, Bennington doesn't ask that. We certainly ask for your academic interests, but you apply to the college as a whole. Uh, and so you aren't kind of in any way uh, held to what you said your academic interests in the application were, uh, to what you can then go on to study when you arrive. Uh, some colleges will ask you what your intended major is, uh, but within the majority of, of liberal arts colleges and all liberal arts colleges, you will have the option to say undecided, which essentially mean, uh, means I'm not ready to say you know, what one or two subjects I want to study right now, um, but I will later on. Awesome. I think, I think I've gotten through the questions in the chat, but does anyone else have any questions at all? I'm, I'm more than happy to, to answer those. Perfect. Well, um, as I said, everyone, if you know any questions do come up, um, please feel free to, to send me an email. Um, I'll also type my email in the chat just in case anyone didn't have a chance to grab it from the presentation. Um, I work with students uh, primarily from Western Europe and Pakistan, uh, as well as students from Vermont, New Hampshire and Maine in the US. Um, so I, I like to think I have a pretty good uh, kind of sense of uh, most educational styles and transitions from high school to college. So please feel free to send any and all questions my way. How are we doing for time, Vilhana? Do we have time for some more questions? What kind of study abroad programs are offered at Bennington? That's another awesome question. So um, again, uh, every single college will offer different kinds of study abroad opportunities. Uh, at Bennington, we have a study away office. Uh, a lot of students choose to uh, spend their fieldwork terms outside of the US. Uh, so that kind of six week period of time where you pursue a form of work experience, you can do that abroad. But also we have over 80 different partnerships with colleges and universities, both in the US and abroad. Uh, some of the most common is the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, we have a, a good number of students who study abroad at the Arava Institute in Israel, particularly related to environmental studies and the social sciences. Um, but really, the idea is that our study away office is there to help you uh, in terms of figuring out if you would like to study away where it might be. Uh, so perhaps if you're studying a foreign language and you want to go to uh, a country where the language of instruction at a school is that language or also the first language of that nation is that language. Um, or if it's a particular kind of subject area that you want to pursue more deeply. Uh, for example, we had a student who uh, went to the new school in Florida um, because she was passionate about neuroscience uh, and couldn't uh, truly dig as deep as she wanted to in that subject at Bennington. Uh, and so we really encourage students to study abroad if they uh, would like to. Um, if you don't have as much of an idea about where you want to go or what you want to do with that study abroad, um, you can just visit our wonderful 
uh, staff in the Office of Study Away, uh, and they will help you figure out the rest of the process as well. That's a great question. How much of the international student body receives financial aid? Um, so we don't have separate uh, kind of separated figures um, for international students versus domestic students in terms of the amount who receive financial aid, but 92% uh, of our students at Bennington receive some form of aid. So either institutional aid, uh, or uh, kind of loans or grants or scholarships that are external to. Um, over 65% of our students receive Bennington specific uh, financial aid. Uh, and so particularly among our international student pool, a higher percentage of students do receive uh, financial aid compared to domestic students. Um, we are really committed to uh, attempting to, you know, make Bennington an affordable education for as many students as we possibly can. Um, one important note is that we are uh, a need aware school, uh, which essentially means that we do uh, know, we do take students' financial need uh, into consideration throughout the application process, um, but also we can't uh, meet the need of every single international student who applies to Bennington. Uh, we truly wish we could, but it is more competitive for international students who um, uh, need uh, significant financial aid, almost full financial aid to be able to attend. Uh, but certainly we do have a significant amount of international students who are on uh, also a significant amount of financial aid. Awesome. Does anyone else have any questions? Do you have any questions at all, Bilhana? Awesome. Well, I will hang around uh, for as you know as as long as we have left of the session. If any questions pop up for you folks, please feel free to to either say them via audio or put them in the chat box. Greek life, what a great question. Um, so at Bennington, we don't have Greek life. Um, we do have uh, what's known as a, a residential live-learn model. So the majority of our students do live on campus uh, throughout their four years. So we've got 18 on-campus houses that do look a lot, um, kind of like the Greek life houses that you might see kind of in TV and movies. They're, uh, you know, 
uh, 12 of them are kind of 1930s colonial style is what we call them they're just you know white wooden houses and they do have that really homey feel uh, versus kind of more cinder block dorms that you might see uh, a lot of larger institutions um, so although Greek life isn't present a lot of the benefits of Greek life that I've heard uh, some of my peers talk about in terms of you know community building uh, service to others uh, kind of community engagement uh, is very much still present among uh, kind of the housing community at Bennington as well. Um, we have another question about is there a maximum number of courses a student can take? Um, so we do have recommendations around what an average course load looks like and we really don't want students to overwhelm themselves and end up uh, you know kind of uh, not putting their health and wellness first over taking as many courses as they can. Um, so at Bennington, for example, our average course load is 16 credits uh, a semester. So every, uh, you know, fall or spring, every six months, um, that translates to about four to six different classes, uh, depending on the amount of credits each class does. So uh, I think the easiest way to remember it for Bennington is that, you know, 16 uh, credits is equal to 16 hours in class every week. I have seen students take up to, you know, 20, 22 credits as well, um, but I wouldn't encourage it. I would definitely say stick in between that kind of 14 to 18 credit mark is the sweet spot for students to be able to, you know, thrive academically, um, but also uh, thrive in terms of community engagement and uh, kind of student life beyond the classroom as well. I will also, just for those of you who are interested, um, I will post a link to our website as well um, and how to apply as an international student. There we go. International students comprise around 20% um, of our student population at Bennington. So uh, it's a significant amount and certainly um, in terms of thinking about what that means for uh, kind of forging an international student community as well, um, that's, that's truly important to us. Um, we offer a separate uh, additional orientation for international students who do attend Bennington. Uh, as most of the liberal arts colleges will as well, just so that you can not only become, you know, acclimated to the college and to the US in general, but also that you can form community among and between each other, uh, so that you can, uh, you know, have a support system, a support ecosystem readily available to you throughout the rest of your time in college as well. I think we've probably got time for one or two more questions if if anyone has them as well. Um, I have one more question specifically for Bennington. I wanted to ask you uh, what sports are most common there? I mean, like sport clubs or... Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, that's also something to definitely take into account as you're exploring uh, different liberal arts colleges is uh, what 
extracurricular activities they offer and at what level. Uh, so sports is a great example. If you're someone who you know is truly passionate about sports, um, finding a school that offers it at the level that you uh, would like to participate in is certainly important. So for example, uh, at Bennington, uh, we don't have uh, kind of competitive uh, sports, so division level sports is what it's called, the league that, that a lot of colleges and universities play in. Um, so there's different levels. There's division one, which is you know best of the best, then division two, and then division three. Uh, and so Bennington isn't a division level school, but we do offer uh, over 55 different clubs and organizations on campus. So for 700 students, it's, it's, it's pretty hefty. Um, I'd by far say the most popular sports uh, clubs, which are all co-ed, which means uh, there's no kind of separation of, of teams based on gender or class year. Um, our most popular is certainly soccer, uh, as well as ultimate frisbee, um, which I don't know if, if you've all heard of. It was certainly a foreign sport to me before I came to the US, uh, but it's essentially kind of like basketball, but with a frisbee, I guess would be my, my ultimate answer. Um, as well as tennis is also uh, quite popular. Um, we had a cricket team as well uh, that became really popular. I think that disbanded a year ago though, but that's ready to be picked up as well. Um, the, the bottom line really for clubs and organizations at Bennington is that um, we want to make it as easy as possible for students to create that space to pursue what they're interested in. So, uh, you know, if you're passionate about you know, dominoes or Quidditch or whatever it might be, and you would like to create a club for it, similarly with a sport, you know, if you're passionate about netball or rounders or something that perhaps isn't offered as commonly in the U.S., uh, you can uh, go to the Office of Student Engagement as long as you can find, you know, two or three people who would also like to participate. You don't have to find an entire team. Uh, you can just make the proposal and, you know, gain a budget. And there you have it. You have your kind of club or organization as well. Thank you for that question. Any final questions or thoughts from anyone? Thank you all so much again for, for coming to hear about Progressive Liberal Arts Colleges. I'm back and don't want to hijack. I don't know what was talked about. Did we talk about international financial aid? Yes, yeah, we, we did briefly. So I'll just kind of also mention the, the actual process for it in logistics. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, the majority of, of our international students are on financial aid, um, specifically Bennington need-based aid as well. Uh, we also offer merit-based scholarships. So there's really two different financial aid available to international students. Um, every single penny of Bennington-specific aid uh, is as available to international students as domestic students. So we don't exclude international students from any of the aid we have available. Um, that is Bennington money, not uh, kind of federal money from the US. Uh, so students uh, are eligible for two different kinds. We have what's known as merit-based aid, um, which is not financial aid that you need to apply for. Um, it's purely based on, you know, your academic success as well as your uh, accomplishments uh, in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Um, and that is uh, kind of distributed among students regardless of how much uh, financial aid they um, kind of need to, to, to be able to attend. Um, so that is awarded equally among students who don't need any financial aid and students who, uh, you know, need a significant amount of financial aid. Um, then we also have need-based aid. So after we've awarded international students uh, who we would you know, really want to admit and bring to campus uh, kind of merit-based aid from the strength of their application, uh, then we attempt to bridge the gap uh, using need-based aid. 
uh, which is also available to international students. So to be considered for an INE based aid, uh, we just ask that you submit uh, the international student financial aid application, uh, as well as the CSS profile, which I'm sure uh, kind of you'll be learning a lot more about over the course of the next year or so. Um, if any questions ever come up uh, about financial aid as you're applying to a specific college, never hesitate to contact that college's financial aid office. Um, your admissions counsellors at each different college will be able to connect you with uh, someone there to be able to talk through your specific circumstance uh, and help kind of you know walk you through uh, the process for that specific institution. Uh, so at Bennington, uh, we certainly offer international students all of our, our kind of aid available uh, equally as we do domestic students as well. Thank you for going uh, into detail about that. Uh, essentially, like uh, what I'm gathering is, so most Macedonians, as you probably understand by virtue of like the GDP per capita of the country, like the parents of many of the students here would need to work for their lifetimes to afford a year of Bennington education. Uh, so like, it's uh, great that uh, like Bennington is like uh, nice to international students, like they're nice to Americans. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, uh, in terms of, of thinking about affordability uh, at Bennington, you know, we, we understand that we, we are a small, you know, private liberal arts college um, and we don't have the capacity to meet every single student's need, um, but we do, uh, you know, kind of really want to meet the need of as many students as possible and, and uh, kind of going, I know going through the financial aid process is, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty brutal. Uh, I remember, you know, they, the forms ask for everything but the name of your dog, right? Um, so please never hesitate to reach out for kind of any assistance from any, you know, of the financial aid and admission staff members for each college. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for having me. It was a, an absolute pleasure. And again, if any questions come up after today, please feel free to uh, send me an email. Um, more than happy to talk to any and all of you about Bennington and beyond. So thank you all so much. Uh, one more thing. What, what is your email? Can you send it to the chat? Yes, I will uh, kind of pop it into the chat again, just so it's right at the front. Thank you. There we go. Awesome, thank you all so much. Hopefully I will speak to you all over the course of the next year or so. Thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day.